In this video, we will discuss an mRNA syntax and see how the process of translation in mRNA syntax differs between the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes. And towards the end, we will see what general machinery is required to process the mRNA. So just to put you on the same starting point, if we look at the information flow in cells, which you may have heard as part of the central dogma, the information in the double-stranded DNA is converted into RNA and the information from the RNA is converted into proteins. And proteins do most everything in our body. The transmission from DNA to RNA occurs in the process of transcription, and the conversion of the information from RNA to protein occurs during translation. If you're interested in transcription, I have a series of videos and a playlist on transcription, and you can find links to them down in the description. For this video, I am going to focus on translation only. Okay then, let's talk about the mRNA syntax first. Following transcription, you get the mRNA that has a 5' UTR, which is a region which is not translated. But it serves other important functions. One of them is that it often contains a ribosome binding site, which is a site that ribosome recognizes. Now, just for notation, the first base of mRNA is called transcription start site. But right after the untranslated region, you have the translation region. And the start of that is called the translation start site. And then at the end of the translation region, you have the translation stop site. In a moment, we will see exactly what these start and stop sites are. Just like you have the 5' UTR in the beginning, the 3' end of the mRNA also has a UTR, which is called the 3' UTR. 3' UTR usually impacts the stability of the RNA or how efficient the translation process is. Now to start the process of translation, the ribosome is recruited at the 5' UTR of the mRNA, and it starts scanning the region for some specific signal. And usually this signal is this ribosome binding site, which positions the ribosome to find the translational start site. And then the ribosome starts processing the mRNA by reading three bases at a time, which is also known as a triplet, or more generally we refer this as codon. So here the AUG is a codon, which is read by the ribosome, and this codon is decoded into an amino acid. Once that is done, the ribosome moves to the next codon, the GCC, and decodes it into another amino acid. And then it moves on to the ACC and decodes that into an amino acid. And these amino acids are stitched together to form a chain. And the ribosome now keeps moving and decoding the codons into amino acid until it hits the stop codon. And when it reaches the stop codon, it releases the chain of amino acid, which is then folded on into a specific protein. This chain of amino acid is usually referred to as a polypeptide. And after some folding and tweaks, the polypeptide becomes a functional protein. Now to fill in some gaps about the stop codon, there are three possible stop codons. And they are UAA, UGA, and UAG. If the ribosome reads any one of these, the translation process terminates. On the other hand, there is only one start codon, which is the AUG. And since AUG is the first one to be read, it defines the set of codons that will be decoded by the ribosome. And since there are four bases in mRNA, namely A, U, G, and C, and there are three bases that are read at once, you can have 64 different types of codons. And since there are three stop codons that we just mentioned, only 61 codons of these 64 code for some amino acid. And you can find which codon translates to which amino acid by looking at the codon table. You can find this table online or in any standard biology textbook. All right, so this was a generalized mRNA structure. Now let's get a bit more concrete and see some specifics about the prokaryotic mRNA syntax. The overall syntax is pretty much the same, with a 5' UTR, a start codon, and then any stop codon at the end, which is then followed by a 3' UTR. The 5' UTR has the ribosome binding site, and in prokaryotes, this ribosome binding site is called the shine delgarno sequence. For short, you can call it the SD sequence, and it is named after two Australian scientists that discovered this sequence. Now we can contrast this simple prokaryotic mRNA syntax against the more complicated eukaryotic mRNA syntax. The basic overall syntax remains unchanged. You have 5' UTR, a start codon, a stop codon, and at the end, this is followed by a 3' UTR. 
But as we have seen in the transcription processing video, the mRNA in eukaryotes has a poly A tail at the 3' end, which is bound by poly A binding proteins. Now, similar to prokaryotes, eukaryotes also have a ribosome binding site in the 5' UTR, which in eukaryotes is called the Kozak sequence. And again, this sequence is named after Marilyn Kozak, who discovered this in 1980s. The Kozak sequence and the Shine Dalgarno sequence are functionally similar, but their underlying sequence composition is quite different. Oh, and one other thing that is different in eukaryotic mRNA is the presence of the 5' cap structure. Now that we understand how syntax differs in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, let's see how it affects the translation process itself. In eukaryotes, we noted that the 5' cap binds the eukaryotic initiation factor 4E, and the bulk of the mRNA in eukaryotes folds itself back, where the poly A binding proteins recruit EIF4G. So the EIF4E and 4G interact with each other. This interaction then leads to the recruitment of ribosome onto the mRNA, which then moves along the mRNA and makes the protein. An interesting thing to note here is that once the ribosome moves from 5' prime to 3' prime direction, a new ribosome is recruited, and this generates a constant flow of ribosomes onto the mRNA which means that at any given point, there are multiple ribosomes moving on the same mRNA. And this sort of structure of the same mRNA bound by multiple ribosomes is called the polyribosome structure. And because the mRNA in eukaryotes is looped because of this interaction between EIF4E and 4G, we call this polyribosome structure to be circularized. Another important fact to keep in mind about eukaryotes is the presence of organelles and that the mRNA is made in the nucleus, which is then transported into cytoplasm. And ribosomes are only found in the cytoplasm, and that's where the translation occurs. In contrast, if we look at the prokaryotes, you may recall that they don't have any membrane-bound organelles, so the ribosomes are in close proximity with the DNA that may be involved in transcription. In prokaryotes, there are no physical boundaries as we see in eukaryotes. And this sort of leads to an interesting observation. Say that this DNA in prokaryotes is engaged in transcription, where the RNA polymerase is moving along and making mRNA. Now because there is no physical separation, the ribosomes will go and bind to the mRNA while it is still being transcribed and start the process of translation. You can have a polymerase start a second round of transcription of the same gene while the first polymerase is still going on ahead. And likewise, you can have a new ribosome come along and start a new round of translation on all of these RNAs. So the process can be very dynamic with multiple moving parts at the same time. And therefore, the same gene can have multiple RNA polymerases moving along the DNA and multiple ribosomes attached to these mRNAs that are being produced from each of these polymerases. And this sort of polyribosome structure is very different from the circularized structure that we saw in eukaryotes. And all these things about polyribosomes and lack of organelles in prokaryotes reveal a very significant fact about prokaryotes, which is that translation initiation in prokaryotes occurs co-transcriptionally. Hopefully now you have a basic understanding of the mRNA syntax and how the process of translation differs between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Which brings us to the last point of the machinery involved in the translation process itself. Apart from the mRNA being the substrate, translation depends on ribosomes, transfer RNAs, and a lot of translation factors. First, let's take a look at the ribosome. Now that is a structure made up of two major subunits. In prokaryotes, the big subunit is called the 50S, and the small subunit is called the 30S. And while the overall structure in eukaryotes is similar, it is quite a bit larger. The big subunit is called 60S, and the small subunit is called 40S. And the complete ribosome is referred to as 80S. In prokaryotes, the complete ribosome is called 70S. But keep in mind that ribosome is not all protein. It's a ribonucleoprotein which means that it is made up of proteins as well as RNA. The prokaryotes have two major ribosomal RNA in the 50S and one in the 30S. In contrast, eukaryotes have three ribosomal RNA in the bigger subunit and one in the small one. 
Specifically, these ribosomal RNAs have names, which are 23S, 5S, and 16S for prokaryotes, and 28S, 5.8S, 5S, and 18S for eukaryotes. Now in case you haven't noticed, we have everything here noted by this S. The 70S, 50S, 30S for the overall ribosome, and even the ribosomal RNA has S in its name. So what is this S? It turns out that S stands for the measure of sedimentation coefficient, and this unit is called a Swedberg unit. Swedberg is the name of the person who came up with this unit. So Swedberg is really a measure of time, and one Swedberg is 10 to the negative 13 seconds. So S in our notation of 70S, 23S, 16S, and everything does not refer to the size. It refers to the time it takes for these molecules to sediment. So you may look at 70S and 80S and assume that they are pretty close to each other in size, but if you actually look at their size, the 70S prokaryotic ribosome is around 2.5 megadaltons, whereas the eukaryotic ribosome is around 4.5 megadaltons. So the eukaryotic ribosome is quite bigger than the prokaryotic ribosome. So just keep in mind that the S in 70S and 80S, or the ribosomal RNAs, is not the size itself. The other important component in translation is the transfer RNA. We have seen the syntax of mRNA, where the mRNA is read in triplets, or codons. And each codon corresponds to a particular amino acid. So the mRNA can be decoded into a specific amino acid sequence. But how are these amino acids attached and positioned by the ribosome? It turns out that transfer RNAs are attached to specific amino acids, and they bind at the mRNA within the ribosome with these triplets. So complementary UAC sequence in the tRNA pairs with the AUG codon in the mRNA. This UAC containing RNA has a specific amino acid. This triplet on the mRNA, as we have said before, is the codon. And this triplet on the tRNA that pairs with the codon on the mRNA is called the anticodon. And this is how tRNA help in bringing some specific amino acids. Now the next codon here, for example, is GCC, which will bind to another tRNA that contains CGG anticodon, and so on until the end of the mRNA. So this chain of amino acids is formed when the preceding tRNA transfers the amino acid to the next tRNA, and then this next tRNA transfers all these connected amino acid to the next amino acid in the next tRNA. And if you do this iteratively for all codons, you get a chain of amino acids. Now that may be a lot of information, but what I want you to note is that the mRNA has the codons, and the tRNA has the anticodons. And the tRNA in this process brings and transfers the amino acids. And all this processing of codons and anticodon pairing, along with the transfer of amino acids, occurs within the ribosome. The ribosome has three specific sites that do this specific process. Here's an interesting fact though. If you look at the RNA footprint within the ribosome, you will see that a ribosome covers around 35 bases of the mRNA at any given point, which corresponds to about 11 codons. But the process of translation happens only at these three sites. So out of 11 codon long footprint, only two codons are actually used for translation at any given time. These sites are called E, P, and A sites, and we will see in later videos how these work. In addition to all this, scientists have also measured the processing speed of a ribosome, and it comes to be around 15 amino acids per second, which comes to be about 45 codons per second, or around 130 bases per second. To give you a sense of magnitude, an insulin protein or polypeptide is around 51 amino acids. So with a speed of 15 amino acids per second, it'll take around 3 seconds for it to produce one insulin peptide. But do keep in mind that ribosome produce polypeptides, and this polypeptide has further to be folded properly and tweaked a little bit to form a functional insulin protein. So the processing of amino acid occurs at EP and A site of the ribosome and the tRNA is brought to the ribosome, and this linking of one amino acid to the next, among many other things. All of these processes are done via the help of translation factors. We have seen two of these already. 
which are the EIF4E and EIF4G that help in the initiation part, but we will uncover and discuss more of them in detail in later videos.